right, I'd like to welcome everyone to today's webinar. My name is Vincent Donadio. I'm the Interactive Media Administrator at Data Conversion Laboratory. If you follow us on Twitter or interact with us on Facebook or Google+, I'm the guy on the other side of the tube. For those of you who are not familiar with DCL, we convert and organize content to create electronic documents, populate databases, publish on the web, and get it ready for tomorrow's technology. DCL services help you refine your document conversion strategy, identify document redundancy, extract metadata, and transform legacy and future documents for real needs today and in the future. This morning, we have Sharon Burton, the content strategist, with us. She's going to share a little bit about what she does and then dive right into how to go about assessing a workflow problem. Sharon, go ahead. Good morning, everybody. How are you? All right, Vincent, I have a question. How do I go to the next slide? Uh, you can just go ahead and click uh, ah, on your screen. I think, it, I think it worked. Good morning, everybody. It's a delight to see you. For those of you who are on the, on the West Coast like I am, it's morning. Um, insert your time zone greeting here. Good. There it is. Um, it's good to see you guys. In case you don't, you're not certain, um, I do see some names I, I recognize, but in case you're not sure, my name is Sharon Burton. I'm on the Pacific time zone, so for me it's about 10 o'clock in the morning. I'm sure it's a different time wherever you are. Um, in case you don't know who I am, um, I've been in the techcom industry for about 10, about 20 years, which is amazing because as is, I'm pretty sure the case for many of you, I never set out to be in this field, I kind of stumbled into it and discovered this was perhaps the most fascinating and interesting thing I could do with my life. So here I am nearly 20 years later, still doing it, and it's still just as fascinating and just as interesting. We have this vague feeling things could be better. Um, I'm also an STC Associate Fellow, which is something I'm very proud of. Um, it's, it's one of those moments of recognition where you, it just feels nice. Um, and I also, by the way, teach. Um, I teach technical communication to engineering students at the University of California, Riverside. So if you work with an engineer sometime now or in the future who understands the value of clear communication, feel free to drop me a thank you note. I'm trying to change the world one engineer at a time, um, because I am. Uh, I teach for the TechCom Certificate Program at UCR Extension. I teach business writing for the University of Redlands. And I'm also teaching for the Certificate Program for STC. So there we are. Um, I teach a lot. At this point, I feel as though groups of people in parking lots, I will teach them um, because I am trying very hard to give back to this field that's been so amazing to me. Um, I also I knit, I crochet, I design patterns, I write, I garden, I have an Aussie dog. For those of you who like dogs, I have an Aussie, full grown, almost five years old. Um, and just generally all around kind of fun. So it gives you a sense of who I am. And then something I didn't put on my slide, but I'd like to let you know, my personal bias in our field, I don't think that we add value to our employers to our users or to our field by reformatting the same Word document for the third time this week. I, I just don't. So I am always interested in workflow issues in, in how do we get the most time to produce the best content that adds value to both our employers and to our users because we stand in an interesting place where we have to negotiate what our employer needs from us and negotiate the best information delivered in the most reasonable and appropriate way to our end users. So we stand right there. Because we stand right there, I think reformatting the same Word document for the third time this week is not necessarily all the value that we can add. All right, let me see if this works. It did, it did. OK, wait, go back. There we go. Let's say thank you to our host today, everybody, uh, Data Conversion Laboratory. They're hosting this webinar series. So obviously today is um, day one of three. Um, there'll be another one next week and another one the week after that. And so let's say thank you to them. That's, I just think it's fantastic that they went ahead and, and did that. That's just the bomb. Um, so incredibly helpful there. Um, and I don't think that we've mentioned to you, but in case you don't know, as we go through this, you can ask me questions. 
by going to your GoToWebinar panel. You'll see the questions area. Type your questions there. I do have a dual screen situation going, so I can see your questions live. I may not get to them in the moment, but I will try and make sure that I answer them all. And at the end, we're going to be having a 15-minute or so um, question and answer period, and that would be a great time for you to ask questions. Um, I'll be going through the things that I couldn't cover as I went, and um, that lets us have a conversation, which I think is really nice. Okay, before we get started, let's have a poll. This is where Vincent is going to do the poll thing. We're going to do a poll, and the question is, the most difficult parts of our, our content development process is, and then you'll choose all, choose all that apply. So Vincent, throw our poll up. There it is. I want you to feel free to select as many as apply, um, and obviously other is if the four that we give you don't apply, choose other. Um, and I can't vote because I'm, 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 I'm talking. But I'd like you guys to keep, keep voting. Voting is good. Voting is important. Vote early. Vote often. That's what I always say. Um, so if you guys would get your votes in, Vincent will close this when it gets close. Um, we start looking as though everybody has pretty much voted. Hopefully, we're getting there. It's a straightforward, straightforward click. Click, 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 click. I just add about 90% of those attendees voted. Okay. If you guys can couple more seconds. Couple, okay, we're counting down. Five, <laughs> four, three, two, one. Okay, I hope you got your vote in. Okay, Vincent. Yeah, okay. Is. That's interesting. So planning the content and the review process are places where it really hurts for all of us. That's, that's where it's unpleasant. Writing the content, not so difficult. Um, and delivering the content is more difficult than writing the content. And then about a quarter of you said, well, other. And uh, we have one person who in the chat area, in the questions area, said keeping up with tool changes was the most difficult part which I think I understand. It does seem as though every day there are new and different and, and, and to keep up with. So, okay, excellent. All right, this is good for me to know. And uh, thank you guys very much. I appreciate that. All right, so let me see if I can get this slide to change. Come on, slide. Hello, Mr. Slide. Oh, there we are. Hey, hey, stop that. Go back. Go back. Okay. All right. So today, this week, I'm going to talk about broken content development. You may have this vague feeling that the way you're doing things is not necessarily the best or most appropriate way to do it. You, you, and for most of us in this position, it really is kind of just a vague feeling. We may not even be able to put our hands on it, but we just have this feeling that maybe we're using the wrong tools, or maybe we're using the wrong workflow, or maybe the workflow we're using, you know, maybe it's the right workflow, but it should be changed to be a better, you know, but we don't know how or where. Or we're looking down the road and we see that we're going to be adding perhaps writing, perhaps languages, perhaps more products, maybe we're going to be acquiring companies, and we can see that the way we're doing it isn't really scalable. Um, and all of these, if you have a broken content development process, then it's potentially costing you hundreds of thousands of dollars every year. Not very year, as the slide says, but every year because sometimes I just, that's the typo that you get for free. All other typos will cost you. That was your free typo. So you get this feeling that, that things could be done better, and if you're a numbers cruncher, you are probably aware that the way you're doing it is quite possibly costing you thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. But who wants to just jump on their horse and ride off in all directions and start making changes? You know, at least what you've got is kind of working, albeit maybe not well, and maybe it may be expensive, but it would be good. So that's kind of what we're going to be covering in this webinar. So today, we're going to talk about places that I have seen 
that may that are indicators that your system may be broken and um, in with luck not with luck what's the word I'm looking for some of these may sound familiar to you and if they do then I can assure you you are in fact broken and certainly if none of these specific ideas are are exactly your situation um, it will probably occur to you that oh yeah no in this area that yeah so let's start with the first one the first one and this is the one I'm seeing a lot of we want to reuse content but our current tools simply don't allow it and this problem comes up because we we meaning us the group are using tools that silo content and that's that's what I see happening most often when it's this problem is you're using tools that worked perfectly well for the way we delivered content 15 years ago but not so well in today's world so you've got content locked up in chapters you've got chapters locked up in books um, maybe you've got one group who is creating content in one tool and another, another group who's using another tool or maybe within your group you're using InDesign and FrameMaker and RoboHelp and 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 trying to use content and reuse content in new and interesting ways is just exhausting. It is really difficult. And this is because we're still using tools built out of the, the old metaphor. The old metaphors are books, long documents and books. So even if you're writing in Word, you have a 400-page document in Word, um, for which I'm deeply sorry, by the way. But you have a 400-page document in Word, and you know that some of this document could be reused elsewhere. Um, but just trying to find it and then maintaining it, um, if you need that content and you have to you know, recreate it for a new deliverable, then you're paying for that content all over again. Um, and this is a major problem. Now, why is this a major problem? Because if you need to reuse this content somewhere else, you're faced with recreate it, which means pay for it all over again, or copy it and paste it. And then hope, hope that you remember where it is you copied and pasted it so that when that content changes, you'll know where it is. And by the way, hope is not a plan. Um, I'm a huge proponent of planned and managed documentation. And hope is not part of that plan. At no part in that plan does it say, and we'll hope this all works out. That's not, that doesn't work. So this is, this is one of the biggest problems, which is why I started with it. One of the biggest problems I'm seeing my clients face, and it's costing an enormous amount of money, and is potential for an enormous cost savings as well. Okay, there's another one of my favorites. We manually do a lot of post-processing to get our outputs. So maybe you're doing online help, um, maybe you're doing online help for some sort of unusual environment, unusual here being defined as my tool doesn't let me do it. So you, do, you create the help, you build the help, and then you have to go into your HTML files and do a bunch of additional post-processing so that you can get it to work. And, this is a hu and, and then if somebody makes a change, you have to go through the whole process again. This is a huge time sink and if you're in this workflow you know it's a, time, a huge time sink there's nothing fun about this um, for example if you are using a tool that is dedicated to uh, long documents and then you're using another tool that sucks that content out and turns that into a help system I'm not naming names here um, this can be an incredibly difficult situation because every time your long book documents change, you've got to make sure that you've sucked out that content into the other help tool and 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 you're probably spending 30% of your time just fiddling with your tools trying to get this workflow to work. 30% of your time, think about that. Think what you could do with your time if we could get half of that back. If we could get back 15% of your time and you had that for developing new content for whatever it is and your employer is paying you to spend that 30% of your time just twiddling with tools. It's a very expensive situation and by the way this post-processing to get our outputs thing, this is not scalable and you know that. If you're in this workflow you know that. 
you know that this is all held together with duct tape and maybe some sealing wax and maybe some bubble gum and you live in terror of the day where they come in and they say great we've we've we're adding four new products that are variants of this one that won't be a problem will it you know because you know that that's when you're going to smile and say no absolutely not and then you're going to go outside walk around the building and cry for a little bit because it's a huge problem because you're going to have to do all of this hand fiddling again times four products so this is not supportable. So a lot of post-processing, absolutely, I would say you're broken. Um, and this, this is the one I touched on briefly at the very beginning. We are wasting a lot of time reformatting the same documents. Now, of course, the one that's especially bad about this is Word. And I realize Word is not the right tool, really, to be using to be creating technical content. I'm also perfectly aware that there are a lot of writers who for very good corporate reasons are stuck with it. Or at least it's they're having to make the business case that they need to get out of it and because it's not helping. Um, so that's the one. And I liked the picture, by the way, I am not a visual learner. So Choosing pictures for me was fun and interesting because I'm not a real strong visual learner. But I liked this version because this is how I've always felt when I've discovered that Word has thrown away all of the formatting I did yesterday. And I have to go back and manually apply all of it to my 400-page manual. I always feel like, oh, like let's, let's all jump up and do a line dance. Um, but this reformatting the same documents can also be copying and pasting from one tool to another. I, I would put that under reformatting the same documents because it's the same content. You're just reformatting it now for a different output or a different deliverable or a different place it's going to go. It may be in InDesign, you know, it's part of the spec sheet in InDesign. And then you copy it out of InDesign and you put it into FrameMaker and you use it in, you know, chapter one in FrameMaker. And then you use another tool to suck that out to put that into the help, and then, oh, by the way, marketing needs that information too, so they suck that out of that InDesign document, put it in another InDesign document. And this is craziness. This is craziness. This is a very expensive way to develop information and enormously prone to errors, because if that, say, that spec sheet changes, what are the odds that everybody who's used that content in their own documents is going to be told that content has changed? and are going to remember to go and find out what those changes are and get them in their document. Uh, really, really quickly, you wind up with all of the documents out of step with each other. And, you know, if you're just delivering consumer products, that's not a huge deal. But if you're delivering medical devices or you're in a, an otherwise regulated industry, this is a huge deal. If you're in the financial industry and your, reg your financial regulators are auditing you closely, to discover that you are explaining something that is being audited in four different ways and two or three of them are out of date, this can actually cost you a great deal of money in fines. Um, so it, it matters. It, this matters. Um, and it's a nightmare. Absolutely a nightmare. All right, come on, next slide. There it is. Okay. Um, Localization is what I is I am discovering for an awful lot of clients. This is the driver for realizing that the way they're doing things is broken and that they need to fix it, i.e. get a new tool, change the workflow, etc. It could be that you're managing Spanish and English right now. That those are the only two you're translating into and everything is going fine. But you know just because you know other languages are coming. But because of the way you're doing your workflow, maybe you've got the wrong tools, maybe you're working in Word, maybe you're copying and pasting, maybe, maybe, maybe. Because of the way your workflow is working, there's no standardization in the content, there's no intentional reuse. It's, it, so you're looking at this and you're realizing that every time you localize into another language, it's going to be as though you never localized before. And your cost, because localization can cost almost as much as developing the information in the first place per language, you can just suddenly, you, you just get teary thinking about the cost of localizing this into other languages. And that's the driver, the cost, and the, the current cost and the projected costs are the drivers I'm seeing clients really take seriously. That's a dollar figure for them, for them to look at it and go, you know what, 
we could be doing this better and we have to do this better because if we don't we're going to literally spend a million dollars this year on localizing and we could save 40 percent of that if we just moved to the right tools or the right workflow or even better tools and a better workflow so this is a huge pain point and this is what usually exposes a not particularly healthy workflow. Um, this is another one I, I really like. I know I like them all, don't I? They're all they're all all my favorites. I, I don't love any of my children more. In the current economy, we are starting to see that people are getting hired. There are certainly many, many more jobs than there were three or four years ago. But we're still we being the industry of uh, in general we are still running lean and mean. So while you know that you may need another five writers, you're probably getting approval for two. And there are a lot of people already in your company who could be developing content because they're domain experts, um, whatever. They know, they know what they're doing. You may have to clean their content up, but they could certainly be creating first draft. And they can't do it because the tools you're using are too difficult to learn. Uh, perhaps you're using one of the, the big long document products, InDesign or FrameMaker or, or one of those, and learning those tools are just difficult. Um, they just, they are. It's what we do for a living. We learn stuff for a living, so we may not think it's that difficult. But for, you know, Joe over in HR, um, that's too much to ask of him. He just wants to be able to write the new HR stuff and that's all he wants. He doesn't want to have to learn an entire new product. He's a very busy guy. He doesn't have time for that. So there's a lot of internal people who should be contributing content, but can't because the tools are simply too hard. The best you get in that situation is they'll write it in Word, and then you'll copy it and paste it. Now we're back to that whole copying and pasting and that content out of step thing. And it just simply doesn't work. Uh, my favorite personal example of this is uh, gosh, 10 years ago, I was brought in to convert a whole bunch of Word documents in human resources to a RoboHelp system and then publish the RoboHelp system. And I have to tell you, it was a nightmare because the HR people would draft out content really quickly and, and that was fine. And then I would take those documents and I'd bring them into RoboHelp and, I would, you know, and then I would publish the help system to the you know, test help system area the HR people would go to look at what, at what had happened and they would realize, oh my gosh, I completely forgot to add blah. And so then they would write it in their original, they'd go back to their original document, they would add that content, then I would have to delete what I had imported and bring that content in newly again. Now that's fine if it's only one person. Did I mention there were 20 HR reps, 20 HR reps that I was working with? And this help system was for a very large medical company, which means there were not only the normal human resources stuff, but there was a whole bunch of stuff that got added in on top because they are a regulated industry. They had regulated insurance stuff. They had regulated FDA stuff. So, and would you be at all surprised to know that this was a difficult and frustrating process? Um, it's the process they liked, but they only did it once a year. Um, if that's your workflow today, every day, and you're doing this every day, you know how difficult this is. And you know this is just simply not the right solution. Um, it's just not. There are, uh, there are better ways to do this is what I'm trying to say. Okay, next. This is, this is related to the not getting more headcount. Uh, deadlines are also getting more aggressive. I'm noticing, noticing this with my clients a lot and with my friends who are in the tech comm industry. Deadlines are, are getting significantly more aggressive, but you can't get more headcount. So what happens is you're, you're producing products faster and more frequently, but you can't add staff or you can't, or contractors. And you're looking at an enormous amount of content that you've already got for products that are probably very closely related to the new ones. And if you could somehow get a content inventory and somehow not have the content siloed, you could reuse it, meaning you could probably work with these aggressive deadlines because you could leverage content you've already got. 
and then only have to write the stuff that's really brand new. But with the wrong tools, how do you even find the stuff that you should be reusing, much less unlock it from you know, a long book? How, how do you even do that? So what happens in these situations is you know it's there, you know you should be able to reuse it, but who's got time to go find it? It's faster to just rewrite it. It's just faster. Um, which is true and not true. It is faster. You will meet your deadline, but it is not faster in that they're just going to keep adding more products. They're ju they just are. This came up recently with a client I've got. They've got a, a big product. Think of it as like product A, and it's the big product and it kind of does everything. You know, and then they realized that there was a market for sub A we'll call it product B now, which does some of, but not nearly all of the things that the first product does. And because this client is clever and is using a tool that allows them to easily reuse content, we just simply took the existing content and went, I'll create a new TOC, and we want these topics, these topics, these topics, not that, not that, uh, this, 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 and oh look, we only have to write five new topics. And we wound up looking like geniuses because we were done with our content creation before the product even made it into testing. Um, and this is with a pretty overwhelmed group of people. These, this department is pretty darn busy and fairly understaffed. But we got to look like we were geniuses, so pretty nice. Um, this is, I think of this as a vague bucket um, because it's not necessarily specific. But it, it is an important bucket to look at. If you just have this feeling that your content development process is slow and hard, you have a process. Nobody can fault you for that. Nobody can say, we have no process. No, no, you have a process. But it's painful, and it's hard, and it, it involves a bunch of people. Maybe we have to do a lot of manual copy and pasting. It's just hard. My very favorite story in this vein, um, I have a friend, and we were having dinner one night, we were both traveling at a trade show, so we were having dinner one night, and he was telling me about a workflow at a previous employer. And here's how the workflow went. You ready? Somebody requested a change to existing documentation. Could be a customer, could be somebody internal, but somebody asked for a change. That change request went into a database, and it was assigned to uh, an editor. And an editor reviewed that change request, identified all of the places in the documentation that that change request would impact, marked all of those topics with the change request, and then passed it on to the writer. Did I mention that all of that information was added into another database? So the original database was just the change request. A second database, the editor entered all of the information manually identified which topics needed to change, and then sent that to the writer. The writer made those changes, flagged those changes as made, the editor got it back. The editor reviewed to see if those changes had been made. Now, you're probably thinking, made correctly. No. No. The editor just looked to see if, in fact, the changes that should have been made in the topics identified had been made. In other words, had paragraph three had a change, a change made. The editor said, yes, good, then there is a change made in paragraph three in this topic, excellent. Then the editor approved this, and it got kicked back to the writer, who then went back to the original database, entered that the changes were ready, which kicked off a technical review. The technical review sent things out to product experts, who could then verify, is this information technically correct? the standard back and forth went along there until the technical reviewers agreed that in fact this information was complete, it was accurate, and it was all ready to go. Then the writer went back to the first, the, the other database, I swear to you I'm not making this up, I know it's a long story but it's important, went back to the other database, told, sent, uh, flagged it for the editor that those changes had been made, then the editor started to read, it took on average six months for a sentence to get changed in existing content, six months. And I just sat there while he walked through this whole crazy thing, and I said, well, by God, it was a process. He said, yep. 
if there was a typo in a topic, it could take six months to get that typo changed. It was a process, but it was a bad process. It was a painful process. It was a hard process, and it was broken. That's, that's craziness to change one typo. That's crazy. I, uh, no, no, this is a workflow issue. This is not a tools issue, although tools certainly played it, you know, played in this. This is independent of the tools that you used, and they used a bunch of custom, you know, homegrown tools. Regardless of the tools you use, this is a broken process. You, it, you cannot have it take six months for a typo to get fixed. You, you just can't. I'm just, I'm horrified. <laughs> I'm still horrified. And I heard that story almost two years ago, and I'm still horrified. I, unbelievable. So this is independent of your tools. If your process, your workflow process is just painful, this is a place that you can fix. And you can fix it to make it more responsive. And by the way, this workflow, this painful hard workflow, is probably costing you hundreds of thousands of dollars. Think of all the places where people had to do stuff, uh, and everybody got paid for doing that. I am certain when you added up the cost of fixing one typo, it was probably forty or fifty thousand dollars in employees to put an e at the beginning of very to turn it into every. Tens of thousands of dollars for the want of an e. That's craziness. It's craziness. Who can afford that? I, I don't know anybody who can. So if you have added a team in India or China or some other location, maybe even in the US, who needs access to your content, this is a place where very frequently a broken workflow shows up because you've suddenly got five or 10 people 12 hours away from you who need to get their, they need to get seats of whatever the product is you're using except you're two versions back on that product because it's worked fine for you and it's an expensive product to buy. But now you've got to figure out how to manage this with these new people in this new place because you can't easily purchase the product from two, two versions ago. So how, how do you do this? How do you keep everybody up to date on software without spending tens of thousands of dollars? There are ways. Um, so yeah, that, that can expose a real broken process, you know? We're not staying up to date. Keeping templates up to date can be enormously challenging. The last time I was documentation manager, this came up for my group constantly because I had a group in Germany, a group in India, a group in, Ch uh, in China, and three groups in the US. And just keeping the templates, everybody using the same template, was enormously difficult. And it wasn't because my staff was bad. They weren't. They were very, very good at what they did. But we all know this. You get an email that says, download the latest updates. We've made a small change. And you think, yeah, yeah, I will in a minute. But I'm in the middle of making review edits. And I need to get these done and get this back into review. And I'll do that when I'm done. And then you finish making the review edits. You send it off for review. And you never think about the template update again. And then during the final production review, just before it's going to ship, you discover, oh no, the, this entire doc set is using the wrong template. And that's the wrong time to discover that. that what that means is probably somebody's going to be up half the night. Even in, with the time zones working to your advantage, somebody's going to be up half the night. Because the right templates have to be applied. Because this thing has to go out at 8 a.m. in the morning. It has to be in the build. This is not negotiable. We are, we are not holding the build, the final build up for docs. We're not doing it. It's not happening. Please, God, let QA find some showstopper in the meantime so that if this gets held up, it's not because of docs, but I'm still going to have to be up all night doing this. So that, that exposes a real problem. Um, preventing content collisions. This is, this is one that I have had my head down on the desk breathing deeply more than a few times, where unbeknownst to you, somebody in one of these remote groups has a bunch of files that they're updating that happen to be files that belong to your book too. 
perhaps you are still using uh, one of the long document tools. And, but there are several chapters that are shared across multiple books. Unbeknownst to you, somebody is making changes in one of those chapters. You make changes to that chapter, you save up to the network, they save up to the network, all of your work is gone. It's just gone. All gone. All, all gone. Bye-bye. And trying to track that down can be an absolute nightmare. Now, obviously, this can be fixed with source control, but we're identifying places that are broken. So adding this group in, a for, in another place, a remote group especially who's 12 hours off from you, this can start exposing some places where it all worked fine as long as it was the five of us here in this office, you know, working over the cubicle wall, you know, Becky, I'm going to work on, on the getting started chapter. Um, are you going to do anything in that for the next day? Oh, no, no, I'm, I'm completely done with that. I'm not going to make any changes to that for what I'm doing. Okay, good, then I'll, see, that all works. It's not so easy to do it when it's somebody literally on the other side of the wall, of the world. You can't easily manage that. Um, which brings us to the fourth bullet here, which is communication. Uh, the world is in fact global, and probably most of us are either working with a development team in another location or actually working with other locations, period. If you're not doing it right now, it's probably in your future. And if you're doing it right now, you know just how important communication is and just how difficult it is across 12-hour time zone differences because your 6 a.m. is their 6 p.m. By the time you get into your office, even if you, you are an up early, into the office early, you're there at 7 o'clock in the morning, it's 7 p.m. their time. Now this can work really well because it can be like elves come in the dark of night and do things, but this also can be an enormous problem because you're never in the office at the same time they are. Your 2 o'clock meeting is their 2 p.m. or 2 a.m. good night time. So this whole communication thing becomes a huge issue as well. It just gets really, really difficult. Okay, let's go to my next slide. Come on, next slide. Any time today, next slide. There it is. The way that we do things currently is working just fine, perhaps, but perhaps we know that it's not scalable. We know, we know there's going to be new outputs. We know it's too manual. We know we're going to be adding languages. We know we're going to be adding more writers. We know that anything, it could be it's all working okay right now, but in the dark of night, your biggest fear is it's going to change. We're going to decide that we have to support EPUBs or that um, we're going to add two more languages to our localization. Or we're finally, we're finally going to get approval for the two salaried bodies that we desperately need, and that's going to tip the whole thing over. Um, and this is one of those that, if you ask management, they'll tell you everything's going fine. No, 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 no problems here. Everything's going fine. But if you get the writers out for a cup of coffee, and I have done this, you take the right use. I'd love to get some coffee. Let's take your car because you know where we're going. Let's go get a cup of coffee for a few minutes. Uh, you and I together. I'll buy. It'll be great. Um, and I always do this when I'm on site with a client. And which and it, it fulfills a couple of things. Number one, I get a cup of coffee and I'm always for that. But number two, I get one of the writers try. I try to get the more senior writer or the one who's been there the longest to go with me. I get to get them outside of the office, away from the boss, away from, from all of that, and I get to ask them, so what's on the edge of falling apart? And almost without exception, they'll say, I think that we need to start delivering to X deliverable, and I don't think our tools can do it. Or the way we're doing this is so manual that I'm living in fear that we're going to have to start delivering to mobile devices. But I can see mobile devices coming because it's the next natural place for our market. Or Joe, the sales guy, mentioned that he thinks he's got a sale into China, which means we're going to have to localize the docs into Chinese, and I don't know how we're going to do it because Spanish nearly killed us. These docs are in such bad shape that Spanish nearly killed us, and it was far more expensive than I think it should have been, and now I'm seeing Chinese coming. And Chinese is going to be an expensive language to start with. It's not like Spanish. Um, it's a more expensive language. and 
every problem we have in Spanish is going to be amplified by three, um, etc. So this is usually the people actually on the ground are usually the ones who, who are able to tell me the way we're doing things is unsupportable. It's working fine for right now as long as we change not a single thing, except that's not the way our field works, is it? One of the things we know about our field is things are going to change. And if the way we're doing it is so fragile that any change is going to tip the whole thing over, this is an unsupportable, that we're broken. Really, you're broken. You just haven't broken yet. This is like balancing you know, a vase on the, on the edge of a chair, you know? And, and, and it's all fine until you jump up and down on the floor next to it, and then the vase falls over. So, um, yeah, it's not broken yet. But as soon as somebody jumps up and down, this whole thing is coming, coming right down. Which brings me to new deliverables. And this is the other place. Localization, content reuse, and new deliverables. These are the three places I'm getting phone calls from, from people wanting my help. Because they're seeing that ebooks are coming. They need to start supporting ebooks. They've realized that, um, what is it? I saw a statistic the other day that said something like over 50% of people are now accessing the web on a mobile device. Now, mobile devices would be, um, you know, cell phones as well as netbooks as well as ebooks. I have a Nook. Um, you know, my daughter-in-law just got a Kindle Fire. I've got a friend who's got, you know, a tablet. Um, something like 50% of of the world now is accessing the internet through these mobile devices. What are we going to do to support these? I've been spending some time recently working with the EPUB a standard to learn how to publish things to Nook, to Kindle, to Sony, to all of these other things. And it is not just simply, you know, export it. That's not it. Each one of these devices shows content differently, and you have to stop and, and change the content to adapt to how this device shows the content. And my favorite example is bullets. You would think bullets, they've been around for a while, I'm thinking. Um, I, call me crazy, but I, I think that bullets, you know, bulleted lists, it's a pretty stable technology, you would think. Color Nook shows bullets in a very simple conversion. Kindles do not. And as far as I can tell, there is no way to map bullets a simple bulleted list into the Kindle. I think it has to be done manually. I think I'm going to have to get a small bulleted icon and drop it in and fake it. For those of you who've been around for a while, kind of the way we had to do in the very early days of WinHelp, if we wanted to use a bullet that was anything other than a circle. I think that's how it's got to be done for a Kindle. Well, if you're already doing things manually to get your outputs I can imagine that your heart sings the idea of now having to do a whole bunch of manual stuff for the devices you guys are going to support with the mobile devices. Um, and it's not just mobile devices. It's not just Nook or Kindle, for example, for readers. I have on my iPhone both the Kindle app and the Nook app, so I can read a Kindle book on my iPhone. So now we're dealing with all kinds of wacky stuff. Um, tablets are coming. Tablets are, the market for tablets is huge. I would kill for a tablet. I want one so badly. I have no, no actual business need for one. I just want one because they're cool and they're hip and they're new. Um, but I have no actual need for one. But they are growing. That market is growing faster than nearly any other market. There is the point of view that, you know, desktop computers are barely sold now. Everybody's using laptops. There is there is the theory now in the field that in the next five years, we're going to stop buying laptops and we're all going to be buying tablets. How are you, are you prepared to be delivering your documentation on a tablet or on a Kindle or, or, or? Um, most of our tools right now aren't really supporting this stuff well. They're doing it, but not well and not in a robust way and not in a, we've got 30,000 topic, help topics that need to be deployed and visible and look good on a tablet. So these new deliverables are coming, and they're not only coming, but I, 
a year or so ago, I was involved in a survey that asked TechCom people what uh, outputs do are they not doing now, but they see coming that they're worried about. And mobile devices was the number one thing. Ebooks, especially the whole EPUB ebook thing. And I don't mean like like two percent of people said they were worried about it right now, but something like 50% saw it coming in the next two years, which would be a year from now, because the survey was about a year ago. So a year from now, they're looking at, they're going to have to be delivering in that. And that means that if you're using tools that are still using those old metaphors of siloed data, books, et cetera, are those tools going to get you into these new deliverables? And if so, how? And again, hope is not a plan. Saying, well, I hope it works is not going, if that's not a plan. I hope it's going to work, isn't going to get you there. You actually have to need to know. Okay, so those are some places that, are the common places that I have customers coming to me saying, I, I think we're broken, could you please help us? Uh, it is certainly by no means an exhaustive list of places that you might be broken, but I wanted to give you the places I'm seeing most common so you can start thinking about, yeah, we've got some of that. Yeah, we're broken. Or, or again, the vase is sitting on the edge of the chair. We're not broken yet, but boy, if anybody breathes heavily near this thing, it's all falling over. So we, we can keep doing what we're doing right now, but it's... Duh. So the next two parts of this webinar series are going to talk about what would fix look like. In the world of fix, how would you identify that? And, you know, well, it would be better is not fixed. That's nothing concrete. Well, it would be better. Well, let's give it a cookie. Does it like the cookie? Good, then it's better. Um, that's not fixed. And if you keep doing what you're doing, how is it going to go south on you? Um, things like, do you have time to analyze what's wrong and then how to fix it? And you may. And if you do, I'm going to give you some tips for analyzing what's wrong and how you can analyze fixing it. Um, do you have time to figure this all out? I'll give you some time estimates, some, you know, okay, I think we're broken, um, I'm pretty jammed up with stuff, but I might have time to figure out how we're broken and how to fix it, but I'm not sure how long it's going to take. We're going to talk about that. Um, time for planning the fix and then converting your data into the fix can take a lot. And you need to make a decision, okay, we are broken, we are going to fix this, but here is where I see the showstopper. The problem is that it's going to take staff X amount of time to get this all moved over into the new workflow tools, whatever the right solution is, and that's time that staff members are not spending on creating new content. So the rest of this webinar series is going to be covering kind of all of this stuff. Um, so I wanted to give you guys a taste. <clears throat> Think of today as like an amuse-bouche. By the way, I really wish that we trained my dog for amuse-bouche when we gave him a cookie, simply because it would have tickled me um, to do so, but we didn't, and there it is. Um, and welcome to my brain, it ties those things together. So that's the rest of the webinar series, that was today. So, we are, I said we'd have 10 or 15 minutes, we're right at about 10 minutes, 12 minutes really. So now is a good time for you guys to ask me questions, like, huh, I think we're doing it this way, and would this be something that you were talking about for broken? Or, huh, uh, uh, I'm doing, we're doing it this way right now, and that's one of the ways that you said might be broken, but we don't feel broken, so can you amplify? Or even, here's how we're doing that, do you think we're broken? Questions like that. And by the way, there's your late by one day um, cookie on the screen. There's your Valentine's Day cookie. I, I hope you like it. It's a yummy cookie. I'm pretty sure it's a cookie. It should be a cookie. If it's not, it should be. It might be a pizza now that I say that. <laughs> it might be a pizza on the screen. But if so, I want you to think of it in a Valentine's sort of way. So questions, comments, thoughts, worries, etc. You have my contact information. You also have DCL's contact information. You have our phone numbers. In case it occurs to you later, you have a question that you'd like to ask. Questions, comments, concerns, thoughts. I'm going to mute myself and take a drink of water.
Good question. Uh, what are my thoughts about reuse on Wiki? I have not yet seen a tool that lets you publish out to a Wiki. You know, you're developing the content. Good then, we've developed the content. Yay! We've published it out to the Wiki. Other people have made comments, have, have created more good information. And then I've not yet seen a tool that lets you take that back into your authoring tool, the content they've added, and integrate that in some way. I, I've not seen that. And that is a marketplace that somebody needs to figure out how to do it. And that goes back to the, we've got a lot of people who should be creating content, but aren't. Or may, and what I didn't say was like sub-bullet three on that one is, well, they are, but it's on a wiki, and we have no way other than copying and pasting to get it back into our main authoring tool. And that's, that's the problem is getting it back into the main authoring tool so that you can leverage the content reuse, the localization, all of that stuff. Um, yes, Autodesk does in fact have a documentation wiki site that is phenomenal. Um, I know the tool they're using for that. If you're interested in knowing what that tool is, contact me offline. I'm not comfortable because um, that feels like I'm promoting a tool and I'm not comfortable with doing that. Um, but if you're interested in what tool they're using, ping me offline and I'll be happy to let you know um, because it's, it's, it rocks. So our team moved to DITA two years ago. We've done well with that, but I must say our initial conversion from Chun files to DITA was not completely successful. Um, yeah, uh, easy conversions. If you make the entire move to DITA and you, you get it to all work, you can, in fact, do a pretty good job of publishing to EPUB. That said, if somebody is saying we've got to start publishing to EPUB, the $100,000 investment and, and retraining to get you over into DITA so you can get to EPUB might not be worth it. But if you were moving to DITA anyway, one of the benefits is you can actually get to EPUB pretty easily from that. So good comment, Suzanne. Thank you. Um, my team creates documentation for several overlapping products, platforms, and versions. Development teams routinely branch source code. We've had to come up with a manual process to simulate branching within the CMS. Will you cover branching as a strategy to manage content for concurrent releases? That goes right back to my, we're doing a lot of manual post-processing and copying and pasting. There are tools out there that will let you do this. Um, I need to think about how I want to address tools um, towards in the last webinar because I, I, I think I will talk about some of the things that the tools will help you, the various advantages or disadvantages to choosing one tool over another. And there is a product out there that will let you do exactly what you're looking for. Um, it absolutely will do that. Um, okay, here's a great question. We're convinced we're broken, but we are one division within a large federal agency with all kinds of issues. We cannot use Adobe InDesign for Windows because it's not deemed accessible per the Section 508 of the Americans with Disability Act. Is there any hope we can adopt something on a small scale and convince the rest of our success and convince the rest of our success could be theirs. Ooh, very good. Yeah, David, don't worry that you don't have a mic. You guys are all muted. So if you're sitting there shouting at me, you know, listen to my question. I, I can't hear you. Um, yes, there are. Okay, Niraj and David, if you would please send me those questions offline, I will make sure that I cover this stuff in the last of the webinars, in webinar number three. Please make sure that you guys attend because you've now made me absolutely certain I need to cover some of the advantages and disadvantages of the different tools and why you would choose one over another. It's not going to be comprehensive. I'm not going to go through every tool in the market, but I'll try and hit some of the big tools, big as in pretty popular, to give you a sense of, huh, these tools might support this workflow better. Um, I'm not going to do a feature-y thing because I'm not that interested in features. I'm interested in the workflow. And David, making sure that you're compliant with Section 508 of the Americans with the Disability Act, I think that's a workflow issue. It's, yes, you've got to have a tool that supports that, but that's, that's really a workflow issue. Um, Cindy wants to know why I think it's $100,000 to invest uh, to convert to DITA. One of my close friends is Sarah O'Keefe. Sarah is considered to be the DITA goddess. Um, she runs a company that does nothing but help companies convert to DITA 
choose the right data tool for them, customize it for all of them. And she's, she's the one, that's not my number, she's the one who is flat says, if you don't have $100,000, you're not going to be happy with your conversion to DITA. Yes, there are free tools out there for DITA, but you've got to customize the, the open toolkit, you've got to customize everything, and that costs money. Um, just absolutely costs money. And so that's not my number. Cindy, that's actually one of the experts in the field whose um, judgment I trust 100%. Um, do, do, do. Is there a solution for a small contracting company that does work for clients as the military? Yeah, it's use the tools you're told. Um, but there are some back-end ways. Again, send me that offline. I will include that in, in episode three of our series. I'm going to call it episode three now because that, that amuses me. Um, how to choose, how about how to choose vendors if you're not positioned to do your own conversion and publishing? Ooh, that's interesting. You know, DCL does, uh, Data Conversion Labs does conversions and publishing. They, they do that kind of stuff if I'm thinking of the right conversion and publishing. If I'm answering the question I think you're asking, but I just realized you could be asking a different question uh, because there are different values for the meaning of conversion and publishing. Um, so, so yeah. Um, Susanna agrees with the customization of the uh, the DITA Open Toolkit. For those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, by the way, and I, I because I, I it could be you don't know that the DITA Open Toolkit is in fact free. There are in fact um, DITA editors which are free. So you might be thinking, well, what's the price? Is it training that costs that much? No. Out of the box, what you get out of the box being you know if you get the Open DITA toolkit and you get an, a, a free data editing environment, they're free, they cost nothing. What gets expensive is just using the free as they occur out of the box gets you the absolutely positively ugliest deliverables possible. And changing the, the open toolkit to meet your branding needs, and I'm not talking about just your pretty pictures, I mean fonts and how the information is broken up and all of that requires a significant programmer. And it's not just a programmer, it's a programmer who understands the open toolkit. And apparently there are about 10 of them. Um, and of those 10, about four of them work for Sarah. So, which is why her company is so successful. But it's, it is a highly specialized programming kind of uh, environment. And it's enormously worthwhile to hire one of them or at least hire one as a consultant to get you through it. Suzanne says they've hired a programmer in their docs group to manage the data publishing effort, and that's what most companies do. Uh, they just flat hire somebody. And you, once you've got them, it, you keep them busy doing a whole bunch of stuff after they're done doing the initial programming, but it's, it's not trivial. You can also hire somebody like Data Conversion Lab to help with this kind of stuff. Um, that is a, it can be a very cost-effective way to do it. I'm, I'm sorry, DCL, I wasn't pushing Sarah on purpose, but um, she's a good friend, and I trust her judgment on that. DCL can also help you with this kind of thing. Um, so maybe you cannot afford to hire one of these 10 programmers full-time, but you can leverage the knowledge and experience that DCL has to get these conversions done and let you get back to what it is that you do that's worth the real money, which is developing valuable content. So that's what you can do. So sorry, DCL, wasn't, wasn't cutting you out of the loop. Um, we want to thank our host because that rocks for them to be doing this. Okay, I have two minutes till. I'll bet you you guys have stuff you need to go get done. So don't forget to sign up for the next two parts of this webinar series. The people that I asked to send me an email offline, you can see my email there on the screen. Please do so because I want to make sure I address your questions, and I look forward to seeing you in other the other two parts, the other two episodes of our series. Um, and let's all give a virtual round of applause to Data Conversion Lab for hosting this for us and making this time available. So hopefully you can learn something and, and um, hopefully you can get some value out of this. So I'm, I'm applauding now. Hopefully you can hear that. That's the virtual applause. Um, thank you so much, DCL. Thank you guys so much for attending, and I want you to go and do something wonderful with the rest of your day. Don't forget to send me the emails for things you want to see covered, and off you go. Go do something wonderful today. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye. Have a good day, everyone, and thank you very much, Sharon. Happy to be here, Vincent. <laughs>